the illustrated encyclopedia of Indian history in three volumes to showcase Indian civilization in the most wonderful way. This is the tentative cover. The idea is to have in 25 topics of Indic knowledge systems or the knowledge traditions and practice of India and also the great dynasties and the great kings more than 1200 colorfully illustrated images. What are the impacts of this book? So we can have further books on India in a more fascinating way. This would inspire children and uh, anybody for that matter that might turn their career into completely a different possibility. They might become historians, archaeologists and they could rewrite the history of India in a way that we have never known. This is how you would inspire young mind. My book is a starting step towards that. Guru Radhi Ranadascha Guru Paramadhaivatam Guru Parataram Nasti Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namaskaram all friends. Today let's discuss about my project which is called Illustrated India. The idea is to bring Indian history in the most fascinating way possible to the world children and youth. I'm Sibiraj and I come from a town called Coimbatore and I grew up as an uh, you know Coimbatore being a small town and in a more traditional cultural way and I became an engineer. Later I got scholarship and I moved to Europe I became an astrophysicist. Sitting in Germany I, I, I was working in space research institutes I was missing India then I started to learn more about India, Indian culture, Indian heritage. It fascinated me so much. Then I decided that I wanted to do something for our culture, for our children. So I have been seeing the history books that are being uh, taught in our schools and colleges. Sadly, most of them are quite boring. Our children are sleeping in the classrooms, which I didn't like. Not only it is boring, it seems that we are not teaching enough of our proud heritage to them in the most unbiased and truthful way possible. So I took up this project called Illustrated Encyclopedia. As you can see in the, the cover picture, that's a Chola period uh, uh, harbor with uh, Chola ship and uh, uh, flag with the uh, tiger in it. So like this, every, every time we are teaching our children with large texts, enormous uh, amount of boring texts and then in order, uh, in, instead of showing our uh, history to them in a, in, a, in a most visual way to tra somehow transport them to the other world with, with whatever visual media uh, teaching aid that is available, we are making them sleeping, isn't it? And hence that uh, the illustrated encyclopedia of Indian history is a result of that endeavor is the result of that uh, idea that uh, to make our history very interesting. I will show you what me and my team have been doing for the past few years and I will show you the impact of this project and I will show you what we have been uh, planning to and what is our dreams and uh, missions for our project. All right. As I call myself as an artist and so uh, these are my paintings. Um, that is Bhuta Shuddhi, uh, fundamental practice in yoga and the other is one of my Guru's quotes done in European style uh, medieval manuscripts. Because I have a background in art also, you know, I, in, in Coimbatore, uh, it's not like Delhi. Uh, so when you get bored, you, you take paper and pen, you start sketching, you know, that was the time. Since I had, an, I had a background with art, I started to understand Indian history through art, right? Since uh, we have been boring our children in schools and why not make our history classes interesting with art? That one, the top left corner that you see is a yogi. Uh, probably he attained Mahasamadhi in that position or somebody might have cremated that way. That's from 800 BC Rajasthan. The next one to the top right, you see the Lingas from Harappa and Kalibangan, that's uh, the left linga is in Delhi Museum, such a wonderful find. You have the swastikas, 
uh, you have temples from Yaudheya Audambara coins of 200 BCE. Then you have this Gandhara Buddha from 2nd century CE. See, we have enough fascinating content to show our children. Oh, that is uh, Saraswati temple from Bali. This is Japanese Saraswati. And that is uh, Java Durga. You see the, the Japanese Saraswati with the Japanese looking Veena, you know. Oh, this, uh, this lady, she is very dear to us, the Tamil people in the south. She is Kareka Lamaya, because of whom in the 4th, 5th century, the Pan-Indian Bhakti movement has started. And she, the sculpture, the, top, the bottom right that you see is a Chola bronze sculpture. But the other is from Cambodia or Indonesia, if you could see, is from one of those temples. So her fame and the stories of uh, the fire of Bhakti has reached far off lands and inspired people and ignited people to do great things. And I think one important aspect of history teaching is to inspire the younger generations by showing our grand past, right? We are all talking too much about decolonization, isn't it? See, yes, it's good that we need to come out of whatever colonized conditions that we are in for mm, as many centuries as we go. But at the same time, I think we also need to look into this direction to re to, to revive uh, the um, Indi Indic thought process, India's uh, cultural framework, um, even the material things such as city planning, Indian way of city planning, and uh, Indian astronomy, Indian mathematics, and so on. Uh, and I think it is time for all of us to move in that direction. So as a first step, I think we need to show to the younger generations what are all that our ancestors have done so that we can start from there to explore into areas that haven't been touched upon. The world should know, obviously, the India's, India's contribution to the progress of human civilization. To the right, if you could see, that is King Meander, the Greek king, and uh, that is his uh, guru, uh, Buddha, Buddha Bhikshu called uh, Nagarjuna. Uh, the same thing, what is mind, what is the nature of suffering and uh, he has uh, been, he, he, he was asking a lot of questions to his guru and then he answered all of these things from his understanding of uh, worldview through the uh, Buddhist framework and that impressed him so much and he became a <coughs> Buddhist king, right? I think you guys would have known and uh, that's how the Indo-Greco-Indic uh, um, Buddhist school have started and then they started to sculpture, sculpt beautiful images of uh, Buddha in the Gandhara and the Bactrian regions. Down below you see uh, Heliodorus. Uh, Heliodorus is a Greek ambassador, a Central Asian ambassador to uh, a king in Central India. And that is his pillar, the Heliodorus pillar, which is quite famous. The sketch somebody has done, uh, that, that's quite fascinating that uh, he is sitting in front of the Vishnu Murti and doing a sadhana. Now imagine a Greek origin person uh, as early as 4th, uh, 5th fifth, fifth century, 1500 years ago, coming all the way to India and then impressed uh, with Bhakti. Bhakti touched and transformed him and uh, he raised a pillar uh, for his uh, Ishta Devata in front of a Vishnu temple. The Vishnu temple is no more but the pillar and his inscription is still there. See, if India could lead humanity like this, I think we will have a different, better world to live in. Whatever we may call all this Vishwaguru, um, you know, uh, the Vishwarajan, maybe. But I think uh, it is we Indians should be leading the humanity because we have a cultural understanding for many thousands of years in terms of how to live, how to, how to conquer our inner self and uh, how to do great things in the world, isn't it? And due to all these many uh, centuries of colonization and conquest and many other things, we kind of somehow deviated from our track of becoming, being the role model, not by conquest, but by embracing the world. I think we should be showcasing all these things to our children. Not just to children, but any lay person, to, to even to the uh, corporate people in, in cities, I think they also deserve to know about the, about the true grandeur of our history in the most unbiased manner, isn't it? Why should we exclude anybody? So in my search of what is already existing in the market, I have been looking for illustrated history books of India. I am much disappointed. 
so what we have um, is you know some uh, king is this ashoka is speaking to uh, goat or something like that i mean uh, we have very poor quality illustrations poor research and we also don't have many um, then i looked into what do the western world has to offer um, in studying indian civilization uh, there also they have wonderful books for uh, ancient greece ancient rome ancient uh, the, the inca mayan chinese civilizations but sadly somehow india has always left out as if uh, there is no such thing as india or indian civilization uh, that has never has existed in these many centuries so the western history books for children look like this uh, this is asbon asbon is a uk public publishers and they have cool books on ancient greece egypt rome and so on i am quite impressed with what they have done you see this one look at this uh, one sample from one of those books the the roman army it's not only just describing how the roman army uh, was organized it is also saying how the roman army was so strong why was the roman army so strong you look at the way how the uh, you know the, the battle organization has been presented the soldiers have been presented and the scouting and uh, whatever the, those are associated with the army has been presented same way with the public baths of rome you know same way with the, the theaters and the amphitheaters where they do the, the the dramas of iliad and odyssey and their games see these are all cool what they have done is absolutely wonderful isn't it this is a roman town um, see how neatly it, it has been organized we, whether we know uh, anything about our civilization or not but we know too much about them because of the way that these things have been presented isn't it that's th that's why i have started this the illustrated encyclopedia of indian history in three volumes indian to showcase indian civilization in the most wonderful way so uh, this is the tentative um cover this is this we have made uh, my artist have made the idea is to have uh, in 25 topics of indic knowledge systems or the knowledge traditions and practices of india uh and also the great dynasties and the great kings in more than 1200 colorfully illustrated uh images St nice uh, realistic uh, we don't I, i don't wish to compromise in the quality of the art so it's taking uh, quite long time what i aimed as uh, to be completed in uh, in in a weekend uh in a span of an year it has become uh, three and half to four years my weekend Uh, has become four years by now and uh, that one the right side you see that's the self portrait of my artist he is uh, munishwaran from madurai he has won various state and national awards for uh, in his artworks he is uh, such a talented person and a uh, few examples of my artists you know the one with without the sari that that moti she that is ganga uh from a temple 12th century chola temple called airavateshwarar and that is the oil painting to the the left side uh, you see my artist has visualized how the deity is clothed when you, when you uh when you offer a sari and then you you could see the cloth folding and the light that gets reflected from the cloth folding if you could see uh you know it's not uniform throughout the sari isn't it in the zari area it will be reflected in one way and in the uh the area where the fold is big it is reflected in one way you could see that i think uh these are his other uh, cool uh, illustrations of temple murtis this is the right side is the rama he is from uh, vadavur vadavur is a town in uh, tamil nadu uh, uh, there there's this beautiful rama murti is there these are all paintings uh, if i don't say these are all paintings you cannot believe that isn't it you know such such re realism they have okay so this is my artist and i have similar such artists like this and this is my passion to convert indian history into fascinating visuals and present it in the form of en encyclopedia so what i what have we done so far this we started with the hairstyles costumes and architecture why uh, even though we wanted to do for 25 topics uh, which includes uh, astronomy ship building um, city planning uh, war ethics medicine uh, astro, you know you you can go you uh, know all those uh, indic knowledge system topics so but in order uh, to have humans in all these chapters you ob obviously need the peoples and the respective buildings even if it's a glass workshop you guys must be knowing the uh, 
um, uh, zinc distillation and the glass workshop that were there in ancient India, isn't it? So this is uh, hairstyles in ancient Indian art and uh, what we have is very academic line drawing type of illustrations that uh, we have taken uh, the help of few more broken sculptures in all the museums of India. It's uh, this one thing is common. We are, we we keep on having these uh, broken sculptures and broken motis and broken heads of Buddha. Such a sad state, but then this is what we have. We need to work from all of these things, isn't it? So uh, the broken sculptures for the hairstyles, and then the line drawing from the academic texts in the right side, which has become this, which is. Uh, the middle one is what my artist has uh, given it to me as a pencil sketch. I gave the corrections and then he produced the uh, right side one which is the um, the, the final uh, hairstyle, one, one such hairstyle. See, it, you may think it, it's, it's just a hairstyle but look at the amount of detail that has gone into it. There is this golden headband and there is this flower and then there is this uh, the, the, the hairband which is, which is filled with uh, pearls, mukta. And then you have her, uh, the arm, hip belt, girdles. So you, if you see this girdles, uh, the, these are, all these things have been inspired from the research texts, from the um, books like the hairstyles in ancient Indian art. See, those books they would sometimes give only the line drawing and give things in the description. Then you need to look into the other books such as jewelries in classical India, jewelries in ancient India to put together all these things into one place. Same way, uh, other set of uh, hairstyles. Um, you see, this is this is still, be, uh, still in use in South India. Uh, what is there is this line drawing and then I gave uh, what to fix in all of these things to my artist. And he has made this cool Amaravati 3rd century uh, lady, you know, probably our one of our grandmothers dressed so nicely. Then you have Chandra Ketugar. This Chandra Ketugar you don't even see in the history books. It is still coming up. People are, you know, these things are still in the research. So we have included some from the Chandra Ketugar as well. You know, nice Bengali looking face with the Bengali bindi probably. Uh, I will come to the bindi part a bit later. Uh, look at the hairstyles, the, the bun on the two sides and there is this uh, design in the middle and we have put all of these things uh, here. Yes, uh, the accuracy part, we are still working to fine tune everything but I am showing you what we have done so far. Uh, why not just women, why not men? They also had cool looking uh, ear ornaments and hairstyles. Uh, these have become nice uh, illustrations and the, the pencil sketches when I approved my artists have produced these beautiful uh, individual hairstyle illustrations. Each of this took more than a week for both of us and this resulted in one page called Hairstyles in Ancient India. Isn't it amazing? Our team is very proud of uh, showing you what we have done. Yes, how accurate are all of these things? So since I am not an academically trained historian, there will be the all these things including the reference materials will be going to uh, a team of um, uh, pro-Indic historians who are well rooted in our Sanskriti, in our uh, cultural understanding, who are scholars par exceptional. They will be vetting all those things very thoroughly and then uh, this is going to be one of the magnum opus projects, right? So this hairstyles. Uh, okay, the Bindi part. The moment when we have Bindi in ancient sculptures, one bunch of people will always be asking us, how do you know? There, there have been these. Yes, uh, we have references such as uh, Sanchi and its remains, uh, where we know from the sculptures of uh, Sanchi the type of bindis uh, that the sculpture sported. Now, which bindi denoted which sampradaya, which tradition is debatable that we may not know, that my research may have, might have to happen. But did they have bindi varieties of uh, styles? Yes, they, they very much had. So, I have used some of them. And uh, see, this is how we convert an illustration. This is another, you know, now we are going to costumes. Hassels is done. Um, you see, this is, uh, you know, uh, boring line drawing, very, you know, un uninspiring, but nevertheless, uh, quite informative in nature. Uh, that itself has been taken from the Barhut Museum, uh, sorry, Barhut Railing, which is in the Kolkata Museum. That has become our grandfather. Look at uh, how he stands from so majestically, isn't it? With his uh, armbands and... Uh, uh, with his uh, Angavastram and Uttariyam and the leather uh, sandals and the turban and so on. Same way with uh, um, the, the women costume. Though, so the, the men costume is uh, 
the men cost men's costume you know the, these these things are from second century bc the baro trialing is around second first century bc the women's costume is also around the same time i would give very tiny extremely intricate detailed information like this to my artist and uh, my artist as usual has produced the uh, pencil sketch and she has become uh, a nice wonderful uh, looking lady uh, you you also can see the tattoo marks on her cheeks those are from the uh, uh, pillar sculptures from Barhot. You see how they have grown their uh, ear lobes. I think probably till 1920th century it was it was still there, and somehow we left the idea of uh, having you know uh, lengthening our ear lobes to show our social status. We didn't know why did they do that, but uh, we we keep seeing this throughout our sculptures in the past 2,200 years that uh, men have been doing this. Uh, the men and women have been doing this. Uh, the, this is the costumes that we have done so far. Uh, that guy, the right side guy is from Amaravati, uh, you know, um, the Satavahana Empire. Okay, all these people were there. Um, where did they live? So, I am going to take you through the villages and to the city, through the city gates, those magnificent cities of ancient and classical India, through the streets and to the individual buildings, both residential and non-residential, such as offices, barracks, administrative buildings and so on. Temples, uh, you know, stadiums, and non-office, non-official, uh, non-residential buildings such as workshops and hospitals and stadiums, and we will see. Uh, this is taken from uh, Manasara Shilpa Shastra. So, the one of the illustrations from the, the Shilpa Shastra, Manasara, maybe I would say fourth, fifth century C. There, uh, we we know the plan of a village. So the plan of a village had a temple in the middle, surrounded by you have this uh, uh, matas, marketplace, and other buildings, and surrounded by you have houses, and, you know ponds and place to have cows, you know the the goshalas and many other things, right? Uh, the this uh, one of my volunteers. This is a volunteer run project, and uh, uh, our team is growing. Uh, the middle one, uh, the, that's the temple, and uh, surrounded by you have the uh, matas, the marketplace, and the buildings. Uh, you know the, that's one fourth of the city, one fourth of the village that we have made. Then we are passing through the village. We are going to the city gates. So how did the city gates of those magnificent cities in ancient, uh, ancient and the classical India look like? The Patliputra, Sanchi, Yavanti, Vaishali, Koshambi, and so on. So this is from Sanchi Stupa. You could see the city gate in one of these uh, uh, relief sculptures. This is from, uh, let's say, uh, second century BCE to second century CE. Uh, look at uh, that's probably Buddha coming out of his uh, city. Uh, that um, you know the the umbrella is uh, is is what uh, is 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 for Buddha. You know Buddha is. Kind of standing there, and uh, Buddha isn't to be represented uh, other than by showing the umbrella. And this is how it would have looked like. Um, so, if you could see, uh, this could be partly Putra's entrance. Um, this is from Percy Brown's Encyclopedia of Indian Architecture. The plans of those city gates look at something like this. Uh, this is from early Indian architecture from by Ananda Kumaraswamy. Uh, you could see the rooms under uh, uh, in the the check posts and custom offices uh, in the uh, entrance gates. They also had security checks there, you know, because you need to, you'll be traveling from far off distances, let's say from Madurai or Kanchi, and you you have to enter to uh, Avanti or Avanti is Ujjain by the way, Avanti or Patliputra. There'll be offices. There'll be checking. What's the purpose of you entering into the city? This is our um, rough animation that we have made, uh, how it would might have looked like. Then now we are entering the city gates and we are going inside the cities. This is Dholavira. Dholavira is from 2000 BCE, it's like 4000 years old. This is a ASI uh, painting if you uh, if you see. Here this uh, Dholavira, Professor Michel Danino said uh, it was quite fascinating that he said uh, this city survived for 700 years with their brilliant water management mechanisms. See what you see in the right side these are all water reservoirs. So they somehow very intelligently brought in those um, the tiny little reservoir inside and also probably rainwater also. And they have managed the cities they conducted export there is this dock if you could see in the top 
uh, left side there is also a dock where the uh, ships from other uh, kingdoms landed there and then exchanged goods in those places then so that's bronze age that's dholavira and the harappan sindhu saraswati civilization so we move down in the timeline we also see the classical indian cities the in the early india for example that is uh, um, you know kaushambi and what else that the rajagriha is there and ujjaini is there so probably these might have started with a in in, in a smaller uh, land area and would have outgrown the city perimeters and the city might be at the end of its uh, high period would be looking kind of this irregular uh, irregular in shape so based upon this idea so one fine day i had nothing to do and i started to sketch how the city of pumpuhar uh, pumpuhar is quite popular in the uh, post sangam literature in tamil nadu and uh, uh, many people have their own uh, understanding and pet theories regarding how it um, got out of the scene most probably because of a tsunami like thing might have happened in those times uh, the third fourth centuries or something like that so i used ms paint just with the basics I, from the text of uh, silapathigaram i sketched the city layout of uh, uh, pumpuhar so to the leftmost you see the um, harbor where there is a lighthouse where the ships are being um, docked over there and in the next you could see this uh, one of the lower cities i think it's marur pakkam where you have the commonest lived you have the patinam pakkam to your uh, far left where you see that the raja lived uh, uh, chodan uh, what's his name perigala chola lived at the time of uh, the silapathigaram's uh, writing uh, that's how kanaki uh, kanaki's residence is described so kanaki and kovalan lived somewhere in that uh, upper city the the middle is uh, the the uh, palace complex so every time we tend to think that palace uh, means it's some sort of one huge building that they show it in the star plus mahabharata it's not like that that is taken from the descriptions given by acharya kautilya in the arthashastra so it's a group of buildings in the middle of uh, the upper city again it is surrounded by the merun ones are all um, what is it Uh, your uh, walls the city walls security walls surrounded by moats so the entire city is surrounded by city walls and it, it had watch towers and it had moats so between the upper and the lower city there was this market place market square and you had uh, a temple for manmatha uh, um, temple for manmatha are all gone long after that but it is uh, described as temple for manmatha is there and there is some sort of a, a magical pond is there where you go and take a dip over there and do the sadhana in the um manmatha temple and then you get your beloved those sort of uh, understandings were there in those times and this is madurai madurai of uh, paripadal madurai madurai kanji of those period which is uh, 100 ce or uh, 100 bce or around that time the sangam area mayon koppul malanda tamarai poodu porayum seerur poovin idalagathu anaya tervam idalagathu arum pohuttu anaithe annal koil which means our beautiful city is like the lotus flower on the navel of tirumal which is vishnu its streets are like the petals of the flower its temple built for god probably the uh, sundareshwara of uh, madurai city is like the seed vessel that is at the center of the lotus uh, blossom the next line which i didn't add is that the poets who are like bees who would come to this lotus to take the nectar right probably the gifts that the poets would receive and uh, this is my coffee time sketch that i have been doing uh, uh, these things and one such sketch is this madurai this lotus shaped madurai city as described in the tamil text that is river vaigai uh, that is uh, the, the the ships that the river ships that would, that would be coming in lands from the bigger ships so if the the ships from rome greece has to come they would be halting there at the uh, at this harbor at the sea they cannot come far deep into the um, rivers so they had smaller ships so they transferred their goods from the bigger ship to the smaller ship and then they had reached the madurai city so you can see the central uh, area where the uh, temple and the palace complex is there surrounded by you have the upper city which is the city of uh, you know the the, the rulers the doctors uh, 
uh, Brahmins and uh, lawyers and you know all these people, merchants and uh, villalars. Villalars are farmers, you know, the, the landlord farmers, and you know, all these people lived there. And in the common commoners area, the next to this, you had all the artisans of many kinds. So each street has been described in much detail. Each street uh, has been occupied by one community, one professional community, where the trades have been happening. Uh, so there, there was a street for uh, beetle leaf sellers. There was a street for uh, carpenters. There was a street for uh, let's say fish, uh, um, you know, fishermen. All these things have been. Um, located within that beautiful city of uh, Madurai, that lotus shaped city. You can also see the roads and the highways going towards the other lands, far off lands. And you have also the by lanes and out, outer fields outside the main city. The, um, the main city is covered by the walls and moats. But then I will show you the reference where I have taken this. The, the individual buildings of those cities might have looked at something like this. Veya Madamum, Venkala Irkayum, Mankat Kaladar, Malika Yedangalum, Kayavai, Marangal, Kanbor, Tadukum, Payan Narivu Ariya, Yavanar Irkayum. I mean, even the Greeks had their mansions there, which are so huge, and nobody knew why it, uh, these things were so huge. Because, see, the, the, these traders and merchants who would come from far off lands, they would come here because the wind is blowing in this direction. So the, the ships are brought from Greece and Rome, from the Mediterranean area to India. It would take 40 to 48 days to reach India. I know it's like one mandala. If you start a sadhana and uh, you can complete that uh, sitting in the ship uh, in this 48 days. So the ships reaching uh, India, in Indian shore and they will be selling their goods and they cannot go in the next weekend. So they have to go when the wind starts to go in the reverse direction. Right. So they have to wait and they need a, a guest house over there. Even they would be staying there for two to three months depending upon when the wind begins once again according to the wind patterns. Even those houses were too big. So what all these texts are saying is look at the prosperity of these cities. And the Mankat Kalalathar is a nice term. Mankat Kalalathar is the Gavaksha windows. You can see this horseshoe windows. Uh, horseshoe is the term used by all this uh, James Ferguson type uh, pro professors. Uh, that is the... Uh, the, the, the the rafter windows you could see the top of it. Uh, man cut also means you know cow's eye, ma's cow in ancient Tamil. Man is also the deer, deer's eye is, is like that. So even though we had variety within India, we also had a uniformity within all our professional traditions. So it's such a complex thing to understand. So uh, these uh, city layout plans are taken from the Shilpa Shastras, Manasara, Mayamata and so on. Padmaka, Nandiyavarta and uh, another variant of the Padmaka. So uh, what I have sketched surprisingly with uh, without looking at all of these things based upon the description of how a lotus shaped city would look like. We have references for all of these things from the Shilpa Shastras. Then to the cities, then to the streets within the cities. Uh, this is done by... Uh, one of the artists, I don't know, somebody sent this illustration to me. Uh, so look at the market square of Sila, the Pumpuhar. Uh, I showed you the Pumpuhar of the Silapatikaram. There is a Sadhuka Bhutam, there is a there is a Bhuta deity in the middle of the square, market square, Sadhuka square. And uh, the artist has represented that in a nice way. And the buildings you see, some had flat roofs and some had this uh, wa barrel wall roofs just like we can see in Ajanta. The city uh, view, this is done by our team. Uh, you could see the houses and uh, goshalas and the temple ponds and uh, temple. You also see uh, see that that just like today we have temples and mosques uh, which are side by side in nature. Uh, we had, in those times we also had this uh, Buddha Vihara, which uh, Buddha Chaitya next to a temple which are side by side in nature. India has always been this um, uh, very multicultural in nature which have been embracing different kinds of understanding towards the reality so to represent that my artists have put uh, put the tree the bodhi tree the, so in those times they would uh, take a uh, sap, sapling from the bodhi tree the, the main tree in the, the in the gaya and they would be planting it in other important cities and towns as well and that becomes a place of worship by itself i think one of the uh, uh, sri lankan kings and the monks I know that they, those people did it and even today, uh, I think few years before, our Prime Minister did something like that. Uh, we have gifted our Bodhi tree somewhere, Bodhi trees uh, sapling somewhere. And uh, the even more, we are zooming down, if you could observe, we are zooming down deep and deep to see the uh, street view. 
So these are the buildings and some procession is happening and somebody is watching the procession, it's a watercolor painting and somebody is watching the procession standing from the balcony and there is a market street probably somebody is, you see the paved roads, we had descriptions of the paved roads from the Jataka tales, from uh, Shilpa Shastras and from our Kavyas, we, we have nice descriptions of it. So all the time people when they represent in paintings ancient India, I mean there's a mud road will be there. No, not necessarily. People had maintained nice roads. Uh, we, we see this in Ashoka inscriptions as well, uh, in the Chola inscriptions as well. Uh, the Raj, uh, Kesh, you know, the, the highways of uh, Chola. You could see somebody is selling uh, the cloth, somebody is, uh, there is a grain merchant sitting next to it, there is a jewellery merchant and uh, probably uh, that girlfriend is asking jewellery from that guy and then uh, the boyfriend is pulling her, you know, my artist did just to showcase how the market street of ancient India would have looked like. You, you could still see the rafter uh, window and the barrel wall ceiling over there. The Bodhi Griha. Um, these are from the Sanchi and the Bharut Stupas. Ashoka, after Buddha's period, uh, 300 years after Buddha, he has constructed this octagonal building around the Buddha's asana over there, around the Bodhi tree. And we try to recreate that as our study uh, content. So, this is the top view, and that is from one of the reference materials. And this would have looked at something like this there is this asana, and there is this Bodhi tree surrounded by this uh, the, the building. Uh, that Ashoka built. Probably people could go around and do Pradakshina in the corridors. Then you have this uh, temple. This is around 3rd to 2nd century BCE based upon the um, Ajanta paintings, the, you know, from the Satavahana era Ajanta paintings and also from uh, uh, the, the Lomas Rishi Barabar Caves in Maharashtra. This is a bit later period temple. You can still see the Gavaksha. Uh, there is a nice paper by Adam Hardy about the Gavakshas. So, this is a Gupta period temple from 4th, 5th centuries. Now, houses. This is from the visitor center of Ajanta, where they have put all the architectural elements of Ajanta out on place. Right? You see the, um, the pillars, uh, the, the steps, the decorative moldings that were there. The multi storied palace and the great halls and royal baths and uh, houses and the bedrooms. You can grasp quite a, quite a good amount of content into all, all of this. So, uh, what we did is we gathered uh, the, the facade of the buildings like this from the paintings. Then we looked for few of the plans of the houses in uh, books like this, uh, Professor Schlinghoff is a German professor and uh, from his book we have found few house plans and we matched that and we recreated a Gupta period house. See, that's the house and there's the courtyard which is a Chatushala in nature. A Shala is that uh, rectangular shaped building with the barrel vault and if you have this four thing that's called Chatushala. So, depending upon your social and economic status, you had this Ekashala, Dvishala, Trishala and Chatushala and so on. So, we have created this building just based upon the Ajanta paintings. These are quite historically accurate. And we have recreated this uh, house and the cross section of the house. You could see probably in the, in, the, in the entrance, the right side is the entrance. The Nagarika, the owner of the house would conduct his day business in the front side. And the back side is reserved for um, his uh, family, you know, this family quarters. So, let's say, you know, Kalidasa. Kalidasa would have lived in such a house like this in, in 4th, 5th century. More residential buildings. This one is again from the Sanchi. You can see the Gavakshas, the um, horseshoe windows over there. And we have this, uh, this is one of our reference materials, the architecture of Manasara. Quite a wonderful um, material that we are taking reference from and this is one of the Ekashala buildings. You know, remember I told you about the Chatushala. So, this, this is one such building, uh, you know, this is the Ekashala uh, where you, you have rooms in the in both floors and you have this huge uh, rafter windows and the cross section and the interior view of this Gavaksha, uh, of this uh, Chatu Ekashala building and you can still see the uh, Gavaksha inside you have this bamboo rafters 
for the support for the barrel vault and a five story building some sort of an office and we also have references one of the jataka tales i don't remember now but we have reference of a 13 story building of a pottery merchant we have stadiums they were uh, the archery matches and the chariot matches have been conducted. See, ancient India means all the time uh, people imagine everybody have been sitting in meditation. No, not necessarily. They have been doing other cool things as well. This one, uh, the inside view of the stadium, they are conducting the some sort of a mock match it seems uh, because there are less number of people uh, where the chariots are going inside. Um, we have a few references for these. In Vijayanagar period also, I think we have one reference and also the Shilpa Shastras also speak about these things. The hospitals. This is, uh, this is from the internet, but I wanted you to uh, see the interiors of uh, these, bu these buildings. Uh, these may not be historically accurate, but quite uh, good in terms of showing the inside of the rafter windows and um, the, the decorative moldings, probably a plaster moldings down there. And uh, this is probably Acharya Shushrata is conducting as some um, um, surgery. Yes, so far so good, but there are a lot of challenges. Uh, one is uh, lack of availability of books. While I have good enough number of reference materials, but still to get them, um, most of which are out of print and it's very difficult to acquire the archaeology materials uh, because we don't have nice HD photographs like the Greeks and Romans would have. Data are very unorganized in a you know, few blocks here, few blocks there. Gem content, wonderful content, but it's all randomly spread across the internet. One, one thing I want you to see this is this. Uh, see the right side is the uh, Greek pottery. See how they have put, how they have displayed their wonderful pottery. You know, nice HD pictures, and we can keep seeing hundreds and hundreds of them in the internet. But when we look for pottery in ancient India, this is what we get. We have three, four books that speak about potteries from different ages, Shatavanas and Mauryans and so on. But still, this is what that we have in terms of archaeological materials and the reconstruction haven't been done yet. So, if you want to visually represent all of these things, it's such a quite challenging task. And uh, yeah, whereas these are all good, but art is costly, isn't it? That's the bitter part. Art being costly is the bitter part. So I inquired with the European and the US artists and other publishers and how they are charging for illustrations. Uh, each illustrations or each page is they are charging for 700 euros or you know 800 USDs and our artists are quite okay which is now you add the inflation this number is three four years before and now the price has become a bit too much. But even if you want to do 450 pages of uh, such contents with the, the Indic knowledge systems, it costs more than 90 lakhs and you include all the marketing and uh, carrying of the materials and allowances and that is going 1.5 crores, which is hard. But then for our children, for displaying our culture, I think we have to do it, which requires fun. And wh what are the impacts of this book? So we can have further books on India in a more fascinating way. This would inspire children and uh, anybody for that matter that might turn their career into completely a different possibility. They might become historians, um, they might become archaeologists and they could rewrite the history of India in a way that we have never known. We can have more history videos and documentaries and we can have games, movies and virtual realities in the most fascinating way possible. We can have heritage exploratoriums without broken sculptures as I have said. This one in the right side, uh, you see a Namaste sculpture that is from Delhi Museum. Uh, somebody 5000 years ago is, is doing Namaskaram to all of us uh, 5000 years later. That's a nice terracotta sculpture. We also have yoga sculptures there where the, the starting positions of various asanas have been uh, made into nice terracotta toys. So, so, we know that people have been doing Namaskarams from the ancient times. But then I think we should be able to represent all these things in an even more nicer way rather than putting up just the uh, originals. Originals are cool, are cool. But as I said, when we put these things through virtual reality and heritage exploratoriums, uh, I think this is how you would inspire young mind. My book, the Encyclopedia, Illustrated Encyclopedia of Indian History is a starting step towards that. It's going to be in 500 pages. 
with 1200 illustrations and uh, more than 2000 reference materials and it's a seven year magnum opus project this virtual reality is my pet idea that we have been uh, working and uh, you know, discussing with a uh, few of the virtual reality experts uh, maybe at one point in the future we can convert all these illustrations into nice cool interactive virtual reality uh, where when uh, our children could put on the vr glass and, and could get transported to the ancient uh, Mauryan streets and they could go and witness the theaters and the glass workshops and the whatnot stadiums the possibilities are endless this is from ancient Rome somebody has made this uh, cinematic animation uh, look look at the realism of it uh, how they have recreated ancient Roman history ancient Roman cities uh, this is probably their uh, harbor and the lighthouse and this is uh, probably their temple or temple yes same way we can have many number of virtual reality content for each of our cities all the classical uh, Indian cities and also for the Mahajanapadas right I have more than 2000 plus reference books all guided mentored by historians and scholars professional um, people who have produced wonderful uh, content on Indian history uh, some of my references are like this ancient Indian education uh, this Radha Kumar Mukherjee is a wonderful book ancient Indian glass um, ancient India the colonies of ancient India elsewhere costumes in ancient India army I have wonderful content for reference materials there is no question about that thank you so uh, I hope you have got some understanding of the uh, greatness and the grandeur of uh, classical and ancient India. So I have registered an NGO for this purpose, which is uh, Samudbhava Foundation, and you can access that in uh, samudbhavafoundation.org. The links and the description will be given uh, in in the texts. So I also run a crowdfunded project. If you could Google Milap. Uh, all the information will be provided in the description so you can see you, you can see them since art is costly and uh, it's our project this is our book I happen to be the representative of this work but we all have to do this for our children and for the world children so whatever support that you can uh, please be generous uh, we will make this happen and we will present to the Indian and the world children uh, the best of the best contents showcasing unbiased true grand history of india please support me thank you so much namaskaram